Vayhi ben Zoah haharon. When the ark would travel, Moshe would say, Arise, O Lord, and let your enemies be scattered. Let them that hate you flee from you, for out of Zion shall go forth the Torah, and the word of the Lord from Yerushalayim. Blessed be he who in his holiness gave, us the, to- gave the Torah to his people Yisrael. Yamod Yo- uh, Yoel ben Avraham la Torah. Baruch Hu et Adonai Hamvarak, Baruch Adonai Hamvarach Leolam Vayed. Baruch et Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam, Asher Bachar Banu Bikol, Ha'amim Venatan Lanu et Torato. Baruch et Adonai Noten HaTorah. Bless the Lord, the Blessed One. Blessed is the Lord, the Blessed One, for all eternity. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King in the universe, who has given, uh, chosen us from all peoples and given us his Torah. Blessed are you, O Lord, giver of the Torah. Yeldin. Thank you. So for those that are watching this on the internet or maybe visiting with us this morning, this is a time in which we invite Hayaladim, the children of Rosh Pina, up front, and we pray a weekly blessing over them. But first we say, Boker Tov, Yaladim. Let us pray. Thank you, O Lord, for these blessed children and the families that they represent. May they be blessed abundantly, Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, and Leah, Ephraim, and Manasseh. Lord, I ask that a hedge of protection be around each and every one of them, keeping them out of harm's way, keeping them safe from sickness that's around about us. But I also ask that as they grow physically, Lord, that spiritually they will be drawn near to you, to receive you as their Messiah, and they will find life everlasting. And Lord, we just ask that you use them mightily in these end days, for we ask all these things in Yeshua's name. Amen. Vahi bayom hashmini, kara moshe la haron, ulvanav ulzikne Yisrael, vaomer el ahoron kachlacham egel ben bakar, lechatat vail leola tamimim, vahakorev lifne adonai el ve el bene Yisrael, tidaber lemor kachu. Ezir, Izim, Lechatat, Vagel, Vikaves, Bene, Shana, Tamimim, Leola. And it came to pass on the eighth day that Moses called Aaron and his sons and the elders of Israel. And he said unto Aaron, Take thee a young calf for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering without blemish and offer them before the Lord. And unto the children of Israel thou shalt speak, saying, Take ye a kid of the goats for a sin offering, and a calf and a lamb, both of the first year without blemish, for a burnt offering. Amen. Amen. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam, asher natan lanu turati met v'chai olam, nata betochenu, baruch atah Adonai, notein ha-Torah. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who gave us the Torah of truth and has planted eternal life within us. Blessed are you, Lord, giver of the Torah. Zot HaTorah asher sam Moshe b'lifnei b'nei Yisrael al piadonai b'yad Moshe. And this is the Torah that Moses placed before the children of Israel at the command of the Lord through Moses' hand. John 1.1 1, 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. This Torah scroll is the Word of God. Yeshua is this Word. John the Immerser said in John 1.29, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. God's Word is written on lambskin. Yeshua is this Lamb. In John 12.32, Yeshua said, And I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all peoples to myself. The two wooden poles holding this Torah scroll are called Eitz Chaim, or Tree of Life. Yeshua was sacrificed on two wooden poles some 2,000 years ago for our sins. 
It's Chaim Hil Makazakim Ba, Vatom Keha Mushar, Tarkeha, Darke no Am, Vokol Netebetecha Shalom, Hashavenu Adonai, Elecha, Venashuva Kadesh, Yemenu, Chekadem. It is a tree of life to those who take hold of it, and happy are those who support it. Its ways are ways of pleasantness, and all its paths are peace. Cause us to return to you, Adonai, and we shall return, renew our days as of old. Revelation 2 7 reads, He who has an ear, ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the congregations. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Yeshua was, is, and shall ever be this word of the one living God that we look upon this day for our salvation. Amen. You may be seated. Shabbat Shalom. Today's Parsha Shemini. And we're going to talk a bit about Tameh and Tahor, to be holy versus profane, to, du- to judge the difference. But also, more importantly, how do we live, how do we live our lives? as believers and followers of the kingdom amid all of the distraction that we have in the world around us. What does God require of us? How do we present ourselves to the world? How do we present ourselves to non-believers How do we present ourselves to believers? So we need to, we need to focus our attention today a bit on what's going on. How many know that the, the moon is about to cross the sun, right? There's a lot to be said about it in the world right now. There's a lot to be said about it in, on social media. I will tell you this, that if you were in California, you wouldn't see the eclipse. If you're in Israel, you wouldn't see the eclipse. Just so happens that right here, for about four minutes, we're going to see an eclipse. Several years back, same thing happened. We didn't see an eclipse, but people in Georgia did. Right? So we need to just get our minds around what's going on in the world. What people are going to interpret all kinds of things that are going on in the world around us. They're going to interpret them as though and f- try to fit them into a narrative of the end times. We need to talk about that. And I think it's important for you guys to hear it and understand it. John 10.10 10 is a verse that everyone should know. John 10.10 10 is a verse that should become a mantra in your life. It says, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. But I, who's I? Yeshua. Have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Yeshua comes that you may have life and have it to the full. The thief comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. That includes your joy. That includes your hope. That includes your vision for a future. That includes your relationships. That includes your money. That includes all kinds of things that he comes to kill, steal, and destroy for the purpose of 
distracting you from Yeshua, who brings you life to the full. We surround ourselves with people that are doomsdayers. We seek the doomsday. It's provocative. We walk in fear. And we walk in fear because in the end, we want peace. So because we seek peace in our lives, and I'm talking about true peace, and I'm not, you know, somebody, let's say you're having a financial difficulty in life. You know, the only reason you're seeking anything financially is for peace. It's not because you want to become this rich and wealthy and, you know, big, big timer in the world. If you're a true believer, I'm talking about, by the way. There's a lot of people that are desiring to become rich and wealthy and big timers. But if you're a true believer, your, your, your pursuit is peace while you're living. Well, you, guess who tries to steal your peace? Hasatan, the adversary. His whole vision in life, his whole purpose in life is to dis- destroy your peace. And so because we're seeking peace and we have some, maybe some turmoil or tragedy or whatever it may be in our lives, we get attracted to, like a magnet, to the, to the doomsdayers. It's provocative. And we hear it and we say, well, what's the end? What's the end of the days? We have to do this. Well, the moment you believe it's the end, you begin to think, what's the point of everything else? And you stop living for your true purpose. And that is to advance the kingdom of Yeshua. We start thinking to ourselves, well, it's the end. And then we start using that as our message to everyone. Get ready, get ready, get ready. There was a message I was talking with my aunt that was at a church locally that some of my relatives attend. And they had mentioned that last Friday, over Easter weekend, that in Israel, the red heifers are going to be sacrificed. And everybody's tripping out about the red heifers. I've talked about this multiple times. The red heifers are going to be sacrificed, and this is a big deal, and it's Easter weekend, and it's the end times, and Yeshua's coming back. And and, and he was coming back last weekend, by the way. Well, all along, there's been no pilgrimage to Israel by any other, by Jewish people. You realize that if the red heifers were going to be sacrificed, that would probably be the largest pilgrimage of Jews to Israel in the history of modern days. And Jews from around the world. And so, here we are, no pilgrimage. Yes, they have red heifers there that they found and bought in Texas, ready and prepared for the purpose of sacrificing, creating the ashes to purify the priests that have to go into the temple and perform the priestly duties and all those things. Because the ashes are important for 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 the purification of the priests. But did they sacrifice the red heifers last Friday? Well, there's a whole community that was told that that was going to happen, and now it didn't. So now what? What what does that community believe? What should they believe? My point is that there's going to be so many things that look like the end. They're pointing you to the end, but it doesn't mean that it's the end yet. Do I think we're in the end? Yeah. 
Everyone in this room's in the end. We have 70 to 120 years to live. That's the end. It's a blink. So we have a small window of time to make impact. What impact do you want to make? The only impact that matters is the gospel. That's it. Messianic Jews, there's all kinds of messianic movements right now that I didn't even know existed, but apparently they are all over. And they're provocative because some people can say some Hebrew words or they think they understand the meaning of a Hebrew word and then they look at numbers and they're using numerology, which is Kabbalah, which is mysticism. And they're gathering people in and they're sharing these mystical ideas and they're creating this whole... Let me, let me point out the sacred name movement that's going on in our, our communities. If you don't say Yah, or you don't say Yehovah, or you don't say Yahuwah, all these things that are going on in the, in the faith that are total distractions from Yeshua, Yeshua, everybody say his name. Yeshua. Say it again. Yeshua. Say it again. This is why we live. Paul said that there was one who came, whose name is above all other names. Where everyone in heaven and on earth will bow to. And that name is? When I pray for your healing, whose name do I pray in? When I pray for salvation, whose name do I pray in? When I came to salvation, whose name did I ask to save me? Now, am I minimizing the name of the Father? No. He appeared to Moshe as Yud, Hey. Vav, hey, Jehovah, Yah, Yahuwah, whatever you want to say, he appeared to Moshe in that form. And when he appeared to Moshe, Moshe said, who shall I say sent me? You guys know that scripture. Who shall I say sent me? He said, Yud, He, Vav, He, Adonai, call him Adonai, Jehovah, Yeho Elohim, I am that I am has sent you. So, it's also a really beautiful acronym. Yud, He, Vav, He. Anyone that says Yeho, anyone that, that doesn't read Hebrew, can you see Yudhe Vave up here on the wall? We have some visitors. So the first letters of each word of this wall represents the God that appeared to Moshe at Har Sinai. Yud He Vav He. This statement says, Yeshua Hanatsri the Melech Hayudim, which translates in English, Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth, the King of the Jews. What was above the cross when Yeshua was crucified for you? Yeshua Hanatsri Vamelech Hayudim. Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. 
Now, why do you think that the Pharisees and the, the rabbinic authorities were upset when that sign hung above the cross? You go to a Christian church, what are they going to tell you? Because they called him the king of the Jews. They called him the king of the Jews, mocking him and spitting on him. If you're the king, save yourself. They didn't care that they put a sign above him that said, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. They could care less. What they cared about is that when you write it out, it says, Yud, hey, Vav, hey. It says the ineffable name of God, the Tetragrammatron. The Tetragrammatron. So here we are in a world that's focused on believing that the name of God at Har Sinai and the eclipse that's going on in the world and the earthquakes that happen in the diverse places and all the things that are around about us are calling for the end tomorrow. Meanwhile, who have you led to Yeshua as the Messiah? <coughs> Meanwhile, in your prayer time, are you glorifying him for your life and the breath that he gives you or are you focused on the things that you believe the enemy is doing? Focusing on the enemy is a distraction. What's happened is he's stolen, he's killing, and he's destroying the root of your belief. He appeared to us 2,000 years ago in the name Yeshua. And in that name he said, ask anything in it. Ask anything in my name to my Father, and it will be given to you. And then he said that you'll be blessed by him. Him. And that his Father would be glorified in him. Ask it in my name so that my Father can be glorified in me, the name Yeshua. Now, I'm not. I'm I'm using that as a as a as a as a point of understanding. Because the last four weeks, this has come up to me by multiple multiple people. I was sent a video two weeks ago by one of our, our members about with Nehemiah Gordon, where Nehemiah Gordon goes through and he, he, he was a Karite Jew and he explains that the name is truly Yehovah and he proves that the name is truly Yehovah and that the vowels are kamatz, patach, Right? So, so here are the vowels for Yehud, Yehude Vavhe. You have a Shva first, Kamatz, Patach, or Holom vowel, and then a Patach. So he's, these are the vowels that were used. The name is the name. Baruch Hashem! Baruch Hashem! Great! That's good news. You found it. But in whose name do we pray that a tree would be withered and die? Or that a tree would bear fruit? The name Yeshua. Understanding, knowledge is different from understanding. You can have all kinds of knowledge and it makes you look good, smart. I want to follow that person. Do you know what they knew? What they taught me? 
but in the knowledge do they have the understanding. And that's the point, the thrust of the message of the scriptures that God presents to us. We have to have understanding. Knowledge without understanding is fruitless. It's pointless. Of reading many books, right? What Solomon tell us? Reading many books is, uh, is, is, is pointless. Solomon the wise, what's the point of all of it? The full duty of man is to love the Lord your God, to do justice, to love mercy. The full duty of man all that other stuff, it dies, it goes away. But what do we have to do? We're being stolen from people. The people of faith are being stolen from, and they don't even realize they're being stolen from. And what is, what is being taken away from them is their joy. It's their hope in a future. I have a, a list of scriptures that I just pulled up in the back. Isaiah 40, 31. But those who hope in the Lord will, re- will do what? Renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. Those that hope in the Lord will renew their strength. I have no hope if I'm living in demise. Let me give you another one. Micah 7, 7. But as for me... I watch in hope for the Lord. I wait for God my Savior. My God will hear me. As for me, I choose to hope. I choose to wait on God and His movement. Romans 5, 3-4 Not only so, But we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope. Even in suffering, I have a smile because I have hope. Let me ask you. Tasha, come here real quick. Just stand right here. Just for fun. Just come here. (laughs) It's it's an example. It's an example. Okay, everyone look at Tasha. (laughs) Smile. All right, now look at me. Who are you going to walk up to? Not walking up to me. Look at that beautiful smile, lovely. And then you see me. You don't come up to me. Who do you want to communicate with? What are you presenting to the world around you? What are you presenting? What is coming out of your mouth? No one wants to hear about Yeshua from me. But if she comes up, beautiful, smiling... Hi. Oh, well, I just want to sit with you. (laughs) And she'll have an opportunity to share hope. I'm going to bring demise. You realize what's going to happen in two days? You realize in two days what's happening? The eclipse is coming and it's the end of the world. The, The sun is growing dark. On a very small population of the world, by the way. But she's going to, they're come to her, she's not going to talk about the moon covering the sun. She's going to talk about how God gave her happiness in life through her children, through, through her community, through those that she loves. Distraction. Yeshua's love. There's a significant difference. And we're in, we're in community together. We have, to, we have to be in community together. 
1 Corinthians 13, 13. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. This is scripture telling you what should be. If you find what's coming out of your mouth is constant sewage. If you have a hard time sleeping at night, you have no hope. If you have fear, where is Yeshua? We have no fear when we're in Yeshua. Romans 15, 13 is probably my, one of my favorites. May the God of hope, may the God of hope, may the God of hope, fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Ruach HaKodesh you may abound in what? Hope. So he's a God of hope who fills you with two very special things. Joy and peace. And when the devil comes, he comes to destroy, to steal, steal and kill joy and peace. Amen. Romans 12, 12, rejoice in hope, be patient in what? Tribulation. Be in constant prayer, be patient in tribulation. That's the hardest part is to, is to wait But rejoice in hope. Baruch Hashem. 11.1, 1, Hebrews 11.1. 1. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for. Isaiah 40.31. They who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. Romans 8.24 and 25. For in this hope we were saved. In this hope we were saved. Remember when you came to salvation? Remember the joy in your heart, in your life? You felt like you were on cloud nine. Like nothing was going to steal your joy. And then, this guy came. The doomsdayer. The one that brings fear. And then it made it sound like you came to faith because you didn't want to experience doomsday. Not because you recognize the beauty of the Lord you serve. You didn't come to faith out of fear. You came to faith out of love. So why live your life in fear if you came to faith in love? There's a difference. One last one on the hope. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Yeshua. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Yeshua from the dead. I heard something this week I liked. Somebody came to a near-death experience. And they said, I died. They took that death experience and said, that's where I died. Everything else is extra. It's all extra. The rest, what I'm doing here, it's extra. So what, he's, what that means is, I'm free. I'm free. If the Lord brings life to you who were once dead, it's extra. You're free. There is no loss. There is no pain. There's no, there's no fear. It's only God. Every day is extra. So what do you do with the day that God gave you? extra. Once you come to faith, it's all extra. 
And some of us have been living in the extra for decades. But you still sound like you're walking dead on the earth. Why? We died and rose in the Spirit. We died and rose in the Spirit. We're alive again through His presence. So let's go to Matthew quickly, chapter 24, 26 through 39. The point of that small monologue was get your minds right. Have hope. Live in hope and love. And let's not be distracted by the profane. Because if you're not holy, who's bringing holiness to the earth? You have to be. Verse 26. This is Yeshua talking. And we're talking about the end time here, okay? The book of Revelation talks specifically about a time that is in the end. And uh, John's vision correlates really nicely with the book of Enoch in terms of what the end will look like. Okay, And maybe in, in a future date I'll talk about Revelation, uh, specifically 19 and 20. But... Enoch, the ideas that John presents in the book of Revelation, by the way, it's Revelation, not Shins, okay? In the book of Revelation, he has this vision that appears very, to correlate very well with Jewish sources, specifically the book of Enoch, that he, they would have been taught. But he takes the vision that he sees and presents where before it was kind of gray, he makes it very black and white and reveals Yeshua as the Melech David coming. Okay? When he would come, the timing of which he would come. And again, there's so many interpretations around it. Okay? You got You know, you got some of us in here are pre-tribbers. Some of us in here may be a mid-tribber. Some of us in here may be a post-tribber. Those are interpretations of of the end, okay, of what will happen around the end. Interpretations. And what we do is we, we don't follow the scriptures, by the way. Let's just understand that. We follow interpretations. No one's theology... When you really listen to what they're saying, when they present to you, they're presenting to you interpretations, not straight scripture. They're presenting to you what they think is being said and what they think will be the outcome of what they read. And then based on their thinking, it becomes their truth. Then then their truth becomes the law And then they hold their truth above the actual scripture. That's what happened with the Talmud. It's the same thing. To say that Christians don't do it is a lie. They do the same exact thing the Jews do. We just think because we know Jesus as a Christian or know Yeshua as a Messianic Jew, all of a sudden we are in the know. No, 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 no. Many, most any, most everybody is following an interpretation to create their theology. I won't put anyone on the spot here and ask you if you're post, mid, or pre-tribber. Okay? But the fact is, some of you are looking for Yeshua in the next few days to open up the sky and hear the, the horn of Gabriel, and you're going to get sucked up into a celestial heaven, and you're going to experience the rapture. Some of you believe that. Does it affect your salvation? No. Am I okay with it? Absolutely. Some of you believe that you're going to have to experience some tribulation. 
Why would we not have to? Why? Well, actually, no, that's not true. Some of you believe you don't have to experience any tribulation, but why would God take us out for the first three and a half years of peace? Let us enjoy it. For the first three and a half years, it's peaceful. Let me enjoy on the earth while we're having peace. But when it gets rough, he's going to take us out, right? That's the mid-tribbers. He's not going to let me experience roughness. If you guys don't think we're experiencing roughness right now, you're crazy. The world's rough. If you think tribulation doesn't exist today, you're out of your minds. There's tribulation all around the world. And has been for 2,000 years. How was Peter crucified? Man, that's a terrible way to die, isn't it? You think that was tribulation? For him, that was pretty bad. Anybody want to be stoned? Anybody want to be stoned? A lot of, a lot of people in the scripture were stoned for their belief. How many Christians do you know, historically, if, you read the, if, you, if you're a historian and you read the past, were killed for their faith and their belief? That's tribulation. Tribulation has always existed. It always will. But there's a very specific tribulation that's coming. And that tribulation has to do with the uncorking of vials that the angels pour on the earth. That's a very different tribulation than what we experience on a day-in, day-out basis. It's something God is bringing upon the world. To what? Hasten the end. So what? He can perform his perfect work on the earth. So it's a little bit different, but it says here, wherefore, verse 26, wherefore, if they shall say unto you, behold, he's in the desert, go not forth. What? Wherefore, if they shall say unto you, Behold, he's in the desert, go not forth. Behold, he's in the secret chambers, believe it not. What's that say to you? That's Yeshua talking. He's saying, Do not be distracted. The TikTokers, the YouTubers that all have doomsday on their lips. And they're telling you the end. And this is the end. Look, look what they're not telling you. Know, I can hear that. I can see the headlines. What they're not telling you about the eclipse on April 8th, 2024. What you don't know about the eclipse that is coming. You go down that rabbit hole. Don't lie. All of you do. <laughs> I do. I watch it. The difference is I believe it not. Because honestly, it doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter. What matters is where your heart is with God. Let the end come. What will you do if the end doesn't come? You won't be with Yeshua. Let it come. Let the end come so I can cry out, Mashiach, Mashiach, Mashiach. What are we trying to avoid? We don't want to avoid it. Everybody, let's store up. My mom tells me this week, she's getting mad at me about this one. <laughs> to go to the gas station, fill up my tank, go to the grocery store, buy enough food for two weeks, right? Why? Because some, you know, they're telling, they're saying something's going to happen. What? If it does, what are we going to do about it? What can we do? So you're telling me that if something happens, I only got two weeks worth of food? I'm jacked anyway. I only got two weeks. And then I tell my dad, I'm not really that worried because I already know you have a grocery store in the basement. <laughs> my whole family's coming over and we're going to eat to our fill. We'll be okay. It doesn't matter what is the problem. If 
the moon grows, if the, if, the, if the sun grows dark, Baruch Hashem, bless His name, because your hope is coming. Your hope is here. Don't put fear in people. There's no point in the fear. What are you afraid of? The end? Baruch Hashem, we need the end. Let's go at it, head on. I'm a warrior for the kingdom of God. Let's bring the end on. Bring it. I need to get out of the situations I'm in too. Baruch Hashem, Yeshua comes. For as the lightning cometh out of the east and shines unto the west, do you guys realize what happens when it lightnings? Do you see it across the entire sky? You see the whole sky lights up, right? When lightning comes? Okay, that's what he's making the point, is that you see it. You see, it's, if, it's, if it hits there, you see it over there. So shall also the Son of Man be, the coming of the Son of Man, will be the same exact way. So don't be distracted by running out into the desert and going where you think he is. Let me ask you this. I, I, listened, to a, I listened to a guy who, who, who gave an awesome teaching, and in his teaching he said, the worst, po- and I'm going I'm to pose it as a question to you guys, and it's rhetorical for now, but I'm going to provide the answer. The question to you is, where's the worst possible place you could ever be? To be out of the will of God? Okay. That aligns with the answer. The answer is where God is not. So the worst possible place we could be is where God is not. Let me ask you this. Is God at Har Sinai? Is God at Har Sinai? No. No, he's not there. He's not at Mount Sinai right now. He used to be. So the point of the teaching was, that, that's my addition, but the point of the teaching was, let's not be where God used to be. There's so many people in the congregations today that are still trying to go where God was, but he's no longer there. The cloud moved. The cloud moved Amish people. Amish people are where God used to be. The cloud moved. You didn't go with him. So where's God at today? He's, he, he, and, and guess what? At Har Sinai, he showed up as Yudhe Vave. At Har Sinai. Everyone I know that first comes to Messianic Judaism immediately has an affinity with Mount Sinai. And they should, because that's where the Torah was given, and that's where the law came, and that's where Scripture was, was made real, and that's where Yeshua was, was voiced, right? His voice, Yeshua, came forth. They should. We should. But now we have an affinity with where God is, and where God is is where His Holy Spirit is, and where His Holy Spirit is is inside of you. So wherever you go, God goes. But now you have to understand that wherever God is is based on his scripture. It's not based on some man's interpretation of where God is. What does the scripture say about that? Let's continue. For wheresoever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered together. You guys ever seen that? My backyard is full of vultures eating animals. I see it all the time. I take pictures of it. It's very strange how they do it. But you can't miss it. It's right in front of you. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, Yeshua says, shall the sun be darkened. So immediately after the tribulation of those days, does anyone know what the tribulation he's talking about is? Ignore the fact that John didn't exist at this point, meaning the book of Revelation didn't exist at this point. This is just Yeshua talking. This is prior to the book of Revelation. This is out of the mouth of Yeshua. Revelation didn't, we had no other text to pull from except for Enoch, okay? 
and some other Jewish texts that already presented what the end would look like. So here Yeshua says, immediately after the tribulation of those days, shall the sun be darkened. So he's basically saying that the world's going to see it, and he says the moon shall not give her light. And the stars shall fall from heaven. I heard a report this week that supposedly in Nashville, there's going to be major fires that are falling down onto Nashville during the eclipse. Somebody's trying to fit this narrative of this scripture into what's going to happen on, on Monday. Why Nashville, by the way? Like, Nashville? Mind you, we're in America, and, and the end specifically addresses Israel, but we're in America, okay? So Nashville's a big deal, all of a sudden, that God's going to rain fire and hail and brimstone down on Nashville, but nowhere else. I'm going to be saved because I live in Akron, and Akron's, you know, touched by God. <laughs> Strange, but this is the world that we live in. So, okay, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. What is the sign of the Son of Man in heaven? Do you guys know what that is? Well, the, 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 the technical interpretation of that is that the sky will open and Yeshua will appear. Okay, that's the, that's the seminarian interpretation. Now, I will tell you this, there's a lot of TikTokers that think that they are, you know, they, they, they came to Yeshua and they've heard some guy talk about Hebrew and the, then they run down rabbit holes and then they try to interpret these things. And so now they're interpreting this as something very, very different. But again, let's just say the technical interpretation is the sky opens and Yeshua appears. So what, what he's telling you is that immediately after the days of tribulation, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give her light, the stars will fall from heaven, the powers of heaven will be shaken, and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. Wait a minute. Why does this tell, how does this tell you that the whole earth will be affected by the same thing? How can you read this and know that the whole earth, not just a line across the country that touches nine cities named Nineveh? Why does this tell you the whole world will be affected? Because it says, the tribes of the earth mourn. Of the earth. The tribes. We're a tribe. Everyone in the earth will mourn. What else? And they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. This is Yeshua talking about himself. He's talking about himself. And he's telling you when he'll come and he's presenting himself as a king. The second coming establishes a throne. Not peekaboo, come on all up here, we're going to have a banquet and then I'm going to come back later. <laughs> my mom's laughing at that one. It's kind of funny, isn't it? When you put it in that light. Because technically, him coming as a king for the thousand-year reign is the third coming, not the second. Just put it into perspective. The second coming, he comes in power and in glory. This is him talking about himself. And then shall trust. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together. Wait a minute, what? At that point? How many believers do you know that at the establishment of the country of Israel, 1948, and the Jews began to immigrate and make Aliyah to go up to Israel? 
and they became olim. How many believers do you know that have told you and taught you that that is God gathering the Jews from the four corners and bringing them back? Well, that's not when it happens, according to Yeshua himself. It technically hasn't even happened. The elect have not been gathered yet. And the gathering of the elect happens by the sound of a trumpet and the angels. He'll send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. This is scripture talking about the elect, and who is the elect? You. Israel. Believers. In Yeshua, HaMashiach. This is the elect. This is what he's talking about. From the four winds, from one end of the heaven. Now learn a parable. He goes in and he talks about when his branch is yet tender, the ter- parable of the fig tree. He put it forth his leaves. You know that summer is nigh. So likewise, ye when ye shall see all these things, know that it is near, even at the door. We hear that scripture all the time and say, it's even at the door. We hear that scripture, that specific scripture pulled out to dress all the things happening around about us to say it's the end. I still believe it's the end. We're in it. Do I think we have signs? Yes. Can I tell you that earthquakes in diverse places have not happened in, in history? Like, for instance, we had an earthquake in New York yesterday. Which just supports the, the doomsdayers on the eclipse day. See? We had an earthquake in New York. You realize there's literally thousands of earthquakes every day? You, real, you understand that, right? That every single day, go online, look up the seismic maps of the earth and where all the earthquakes occur and what their magnitude levels are. They happen every single day and there's thousands of them. There's been hundreds of eclipses in the United States in the last, since the late 1800s. Hundreds of them, according to the news. Just look it up. But are we in the last days? You better believe we are. Yes. And Baruch Hashem, I hope he comes soon. I hope that soon that the sun no longer shines and that the moon no longer shines and that the earth's tribulation happens and the sky opens so that he can come. Because that's where we long to be. But don't get distracted that while you're here and the sun's still shining, that you have to bring hope to the lost and find the sheep that are scattered in the world and bring them to the faith. Don't get distracted. I don't want to go to the world and bring them to the faith by telling them, the earth is going to swallow you up if you don't come to the faith. I mean, that's a scary way of coming to the faith. Come to the faith because God loves you. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. But that day, this is so key. This is so key. That day and that hour knoweth no man. No not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. How is it that we can get so distracted by men that we actually begin to believe that what they say is the truth? When God himself, Yeshua himself, said no one knows but the Father. How can you sit under anyone that gives you an an imperative uh, fact of when something's going to occur and and interprets what is happening as, as the exact what it is when only the Father knows? 
And we let ourselves, like sheep, be led to slaughter. Yeshua's clear. As the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark, and knew not until the flood came. He's not making a bad, he's not referencing this being marry, giving in marriage and marrying and drinking as being a bad thing. He's just saying that's what went on. And they didn't even know that the flood was going to come until it came. So many believers will take this scripture, doomsdayers will take this scripture, and they'll say, we, we have no time for marrying, we have no time for drinking. Now is the end. No, 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 no. We are alive. We have been given breath. We, he has, woke, he has awoke, awakened us this morning to go out into a world with the sun shining and to teach the world about Yeshua. That is our mission. Just before Yeshua was taken before this world's courts, to fulfill his mission as the Paschal Lamb and die for our sins as the Mashiach ben Yosef, he went into Gethsemane to pray with Peter and the two sons of Zebedee. We're about to come on to Passover, right? One of the most significant feasts of our faith. We're about to enter into Passover at that time. Just before he went in to die, he goes to Gethsemane. And he approaches the men and that he found there sleeping. He takes them with him. Peter and two, two sons of Zebedee. He takes them with him. Why? To support him. To support him. He's literally about to die. He knows it. He's on, he's on the path to die. And, and I'm going uh, uh, let to... Me, let me back up for one second and say... You know the scripture where he says, Lord, take this cup from me? He's bleeding from his pores. He's so burdened by what is about to occur. He's bleeding from the stress from his pores. And he says, Lord, if, it, if you could take this cup from me, let it pass. And he says, but not my will, thy will. Remember that? And there's interpretations that happen in the church where they say that Yeshua was asking his father for another way. Like, please, I don't want to do this. If there's another way, let it be. But but if there's not another way, I'm okay with it. I'll do what you want me to do, right? That's an interpretation that you hear at the church. It's fundamentally wrong. There's no way that the God of our salvation would have said, Lord, please give me another way. What he said was, don't let me die now. Let me fulfill my purpose on the cross. He was about to die. Don't let me die. He's just, he is the, the God of Israel. He's the king of Israel. Do you think that the king is standing there being weak like a human man? Like, a, like, a, like a, 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 an, a, an inhuman man? Saying, you know, oh, please spare me. You think that our king literally looked at his father and asked for him to spare him? No, he's a soldier in the kingdom. He is the king of kings. He looked at God and said, don't let me die now. Let me fulfill my mission, my purpose. But, not my will, your will. If it's your will I die this moment, then, then that's your will. But my will is that I continue on in my mission. 
How do you know that he even thought that way versus the other way of, I'm, a, you know, I'm fully human, but fully God. You know, the whole you know, statement that you hear in churches. That was him being fully human. See, look, he even struggled. There's no way that our king struggled with petty human issues. If I'm about to, if my children, if it was between me and my children, and I had to go to war for my children, I can tell you right now, I'm not going to ask God to spare me. I'm going to go to war for my children. I'm fighting for my kids. I'll take every bullet, every knife, every weapon of the enemy. Bring it. If it's for my children, this is what he's doing. This is for his children. He's not weak. Your king isn't weak. So he goes to the men and he asks them, just one hour, pray with me. And he came to them the first time and he said, Watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak, he says. Watch that you enter not into temptation. What is the temptation? The flesh is willing. I mean, the, the, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. He's saying, don't fall asleep, guys. Stay awake an hour. I know that inside you want to do this. But I also understand that it's late and your flesh is weak. But stay up with me. Don't, don't fall into temptation to fall asleep. He's stressing the battle that wages between the flesh and the spirit. It's imperative upon us during these times. During times of trial, during times of change, to have our hearts, our minds attuned to the voice of God in order to realize and understand the direction he's taking us in the spirit. Understand the direction. Have understanding. Put a man in front of me with knowledge and a man in front of me with understanding and I'm going to follow the man with understanding all day. You give me a man full of knowledge, it doesn't mean anything to me. Today, as we know, Gog and Magog are aligning. Why? Because it's the end. You'll never not hear me say that it's the end. And guess what? If one day my son stands up here at this bima and preaches, guess what he'll say? It's the end. Because it's the end. We know that Gog and Magog are lining. The world's beginning to look toward war in opposition to peace. These things happen in the end. It's evident that we live in perilous times. The rabbinic sages, um, they thought just before the return of the Mashiach ben David, the conquering king, the one that Yeshua talked about, when he said that at the end there the sky will open and here I come, that Mashiach that, that Yeshua is describing himself as, the sages believe before that Mashiach comes that the world's going to experience great disruption in its financial markets having a great recession that causes people to lose everything, as well as wars that are scattered all across the lands. Are we seeing that? Yeah. Have we seen it in the past? Yep. Is this the one, though? Maybe. But if this time isn't the time, there will be another time. There will be another time that that happens, another war, another financial crisis, another period of perilous times. The people of God are becoming more and more desensitized to the evil that rages in this world because it's become something that we have to learn to live with. If you look at what's going on, North Face this week again, you know, one of our favorite, I was just talking to one of the ladies, one of our favorite brands is North Face. Right? I love, you know, we were all talking to a friends group. We were having a chat back and forth. And, you know, one person's like, oh, that's my favorite hoodie. I love it. And I'm like, yeah, everyone loves their hoodies. But, you know, they come out with this new whole agenda, this whole new transgender agenda where they're opening a school 
North Face is opening a school for kids 12 years and under, and the 12 years and under kids are going to read books and give on plays in drag. North Face. Like, evil that we have to accept. The world is becoming increasingly evil. Much like a city that is crime in abundance, common to hear gunshots blasting throughout the night, screams of innocent people shattering silent streets. We, you know, when I, I used to live in D.C. for a period of time, and when I lived there, there was a train right next to where I lived, my, my apartments. And the train would go by at night, and it would, you know, blare its horn. And, you know, at first it was like, this is terrible. You know, and you hear all kinds of talking and all kinds of stuff happening outside your door. And you're like, this is crazy, man, like, because I'm used to living in a normal neighborhood in Ohio, and now I'm in a city. And I'm like, this is crazy. But sooner or later, the train became like a fan at night. You know, psh, you just, it was like you wanted it. Sooner or later, if you didn't hear the train whistle blow, something was wrong. If you didn't hear all the chattering outside, or even gunshots for that matter, because you did hear them, you, you, you thought, well, something's wrong. You get numb, you get desensitized to the things that are going on in the world. The evil becomes normal. Because we're cooked like frogs in water as it boils. We are sleeping in Gethsemane right now. We're being led by the temptations of the world. And we're being tempted to follow provocative ideas because we're being flooded with information. We have to stand up and listen to the call of our king to pray. Hasten his return. Stand upon your watch because the time is at hand where deception and sin has begun to grip the hearts and the minds of the people of God everywhere. Deception is so great today. Do not be deceived. Do not be one of the ones that are deceived. Do not fall into deception. We're living in the time of Lot. And we have to cry out to God for a double portion of his spirit that we might bring change and deliverance to the lost sheep of the house of Israel before the Lord uncorks the vial of his wrath upon this world. Until the Lord returns, we're the only voice of hope. So be that voice of hope. Don't be the voice of doomsday or destruction. Be the voice of hope. Yeshua loves you. Yeshua cares about you. He cares about your family. He cares about your friends. He cares about your well-being. He wants your home to be successful. He has plans for you. And that's to prosper you. And to give you hope and meaning and purpose. Those things are all so important to living in this life. But we get distracted. I want to end with saying, we're moving into Passover. And I want to know, I want all of us to recognize and know do, and ask ourselves the question, do we understand the providence of God? The timely preparation for future eventualities. You realize that God, his providence exists. It's all planned. He's planned the future. Yeshua told you that in Matthew when he says, my father knows. So have hope that the father knows. Have no fear. He's planned it all. The physical experience of the Exodus, we've been going through it in the scriptures. We went from slavery to the plagues to the killing of the firstborn. 
to Har Sinai, the giving of the law, to the rebellion, the golden calf, to the death of many men as a result of their rebellion, to God rejecting those people and then accepting them back through Moses' plea, to God then giving them a way of life in the wilderness with the tabernacle as a pattern that was coming from heaven. We've gone through all these events and the experiences of the children of Israel. And ultimately, those events reveal a spiritual significance that would only come to be understood thousands of years later in Yeshua. All that would only come to be experienced. That truth would only be revealed thousands of years later through Yeshua. It's like when Joseph said to his brothers, You meant harm to me. But God meant it for good. This was all providence. That you put me into slavery. That I would be sitting here before you now. That you might have life. And that our people would live. This is the providence of God. He plans it all. In advance for our good. The story is still being written. You understand, right? The story is still being written, but so many of the people in the world today, specifically the doomsdayers, think they know the end of the story. We don't know the end yet. We're not there. We don't know how it will happen, but we know what will happen. We know what will happen because Yeshua told us what will happen. We're there. We're in it. We're being in it. We're living it. We've not entered the promised land. Is that true? Are we in the promised land? No. So what does that tell you? That the angels of God have not collected the elect from the four corners of the earth. We're not in the promised land. We're in a spiritual wilderness that's represented by the journey of the children of Israel after escaping Pharaoh. We still might have to fight against the giants that are in front of us. Consider the giants the tribulation. Or don't. But there's giants in front of us. Along the way, we're forced to ask ourselves the question that we still can't answer because of a placement in the journey. The question is, why did Yeshua have to die? And that's what brings us to Passover. And I'll end with Romans chapter 8, verse 3. For what the law was powerless to do, because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh. This is why Yeshua came. This was the whole purpose of it. You understand? So that we might have life everlasting. That was the purpose. Because the law couldn't bring life to us. He had to come and die in the likeness of sinful flesh. So that we could have life everlasting. Everything else is distraction. It's all because of him. It's all for him. Your life is all for him, Yeshua. And that's why you give yourself fully, completely, and wholly over to him. And you say, Lord, not my will. Yeshua, not my will. The way he said to his father, 
when, the, when, when you are in the flesh, not my will, but your will be done in me. And bring me that great and blessed hope in a future and in life that you only can bring through your Ruach HaKodesh. And let all things else, all other things that are distracting me from understanding and seeing the, the hope I have in you, let them all fade away so that I can be happy, joyful, and bring righteousness to those that are lost and need it. Amen. It is our duty to praise the master of all, to ascribe greatness to the author of creation, for he made us unlike the nations of the lands and has not placed us like the families of the earth. He's not made our portion like theirs and our lot like all their multitude. We bend the knee and bow and acknowledge our thanks before the King of kings, the Holy One, blessed is he. He stretches out heaven and establishes earth's foundation. The seat of his glory is in the heavens above and the presence of his power is in the most exalted heights. He's our God, there's none other. Choose our king, there's nothing beside him. As it is written in his Torah, you shall know this day and take to your heart that the Lord he is God in the heavens above and on the earth below, there is none other. Oh, man, let us stand again.